We ready, Suzette? And then did you say go live? So we're live. Good morning and welcome to New Life. Everyone who's here and everyone who's online, we're going for it today. We're going to just light our hair on fire. So wahoo, that's what we do. Yeah, and even if you have stubs, the flames still go. Doesn't matter. Doesn't even matter if you're bald because you still got little hair things somewhere. We're going to light them on fire. So here we go. Well, we're going to worship the living God. We're going to praise him, exalt his name. Honor him for who he is, because he's worthy. He's worthy of it all. He's worthy. We're going to ask God to come and move upon our land. It's part of the, the first song that we're going to do. We're just going to proclaim that we're going to seek God's face. We're going to ask him to pour out his glory upon this land and upon our own lives here today. So let's expect God to be here. doesn't matter. It says by many or by few. It doesn't matter to the Lord. He comes where there's two or three present. He comes where there's thousands, comes where there's hundreds of thousands. But the Lord is the one that we want to worship. So, Lord, we thank you for today. And just show your manifest presence in our midst today. Lord, let your uh, word through song and through preaching from the scripture touch us in a strong and a powerful way. And if there's anyone who needs to be healed we say, be healed in the name of Jesus. Receive his healing. Receive his deliverance today. In the name of Jesus. We will seek your face, almighty God. We'll turn and pray for you to heal our land. Father, let revival start in us. Then every heart will know your kingdom come. Lifting up the name of the Lord, power and in unity, we will see the nations turn, touching heaven, changing earth. Lifting up the name of the Lord, power and in unity. See the nations turn, touching heaven, changing earth. We're touching heaven, changing earth. We'll never looking back, we'll run the race. Giving you a lies will gain the, the prize. I always have something happen. Is that going through? Ha! Oh, I think I had it on mute. Oh, well. Praise the Lord. God's good. There's always something. Are you ready? Never looking back. <laughs> we're not gonna. We're not looking back at this. <laughs> Woo! Well, I was thinking I was gonna do something people on the thing can't hear the tuner because I had the thing on the tuner. <laughs>
go moment. Wahoo! Right? Onward. favor that God gives us grace that we don't deserve. He just gives it to us because of his love. He sent Jesus because of his grace. But there's another aspect of grace that many people I don't think understand or know from the scripture. When you start reading through the scripture, it talks about grace empowering us to live the life that God wants us to live. So grace is unmerited, but when he gives us his grace, That means we have the power to do what he's asked us to do. So we can walk in his life and his abundance because of his grace. And it's something that's undeserved. It comes because of his favor, but it's empowering. It's an empowerment of our life in him. And so that's that's one thing that's good is that God talks about it. We do it in his strength, his power, and his glory. So that's how we live the Christian life not in our own strength, not in our own flesh or ability, but in Him.
us our hearts. Exceedingly abundant.
Good morning. That was some good worship. <laughs> it's always good to just enter in his presence and declare that he's worthy of it all, right? Worthy of it all. So just thankful. Um, I love that word of encouragement because I actually I was going to get up here and, and say peace. Be at peace. We have a country that is just not at peace right now. But as the children of the living God, we can have peace in the midst of storms, whether they're personal or national. We can have peace. It talks about that in Isaiah about he whose mind is stayed on the Lord. And I think I've quoted this maybe in the last month or so more than once. But when your mind is stayed on the Lord, the scripture says perfect peace you're going to have. And that means in Hebrew, you will have shalom, shalom. Not just shalom, but shalom, shalom. Perfect peace, shalom, shalom. So there's emphasis there in that scripture that keep your mind on him. Don't, don't look at the crazy stuff going on, on out there, <laughs> but pray. Because the other great thing as, as believers, I just want to encourage you and remind you that we're the only ones on the planet that can speak for God. There are only ones. We're the only ones that can make declarations. We're the only ones who have received this incredible good news and be able to herald it everywhere we go, not only with words, but how we live. And the Lord's will is going to be come about in this whole thing, whatever it is. I'm not going to make anything. I'm not going to say anything. But if we believe that God hears the prayers of his saints, and we're praying, we're praying, and even more importantly to be praying whether you want one or the other, what is more important that justice and what is supposed to be done correctly and rightly is done. That's what is really important for the integrity of our nation. We are a great nation, and this nation has been laid out in an incredible way. There is no other nation that's been laid out in such a way that our nation has been laid out. And, and I think maybe I mentioned this before, but our economic system is biblical. Our justice system is biblical. God has this all in here. I mean, when you think about whether you like capitalism or not, but biblically, capitalism is correct. Think about the Proverbs 31 woman. She considered the land and she bought it and she considered it profitable. That's what it says in the word. <laughs> it says that. So there's, God has this figured out. <laughs> and everything of how our country is laid out, the founding fathers really looked to scripture. And I'm going to recommend, if you can get a hold of David Barton's um, foundations of our freedom and listen to that it's a series you can get it on Amazon Prime if you have Amazon Prime I don't know if they have it on Netflix I have no idea but if you can get a hold of David Barton's foundations of our freedom you will absolutely be amazed at how our nation was founded by men and women of God who sought God and believed him to lead them in the founding of this nation. It's phenomenal. Phenomenal. I mean, I have been blown away. And some of it I've known, but I've learned some things that just have blown me away uh, of how awesome this nation was founded. So, so be at peace. Trust God. You're the redeemed. You get to say so. <laughs> We're the only ones that can speak for God. Right? Hear him and make that declaration. So uh, be at peace. Be at peace. Um, I want to just remind you, next Sunday is the Sunday to bring in your, your Christmas boxes if you're going to uh, participate in that Christmas box um, giving to children somewhere in the world. So, um, so last, uh, next Sunday is the last Sunday you can do that. Information's all back there. And um, I hope as many as possible who are able to do it would do it. It's such a great, great way to bless because they get the good news in those boxes too. 
they get to hear about the Lord. And then they have like a, um, a little discipleship training afterwards for those who come to the Lord. And then they take them through a class called The Greatest Journey. So it's, it's a great, great thing to do. So um, we're going to give to the Lord, honor his name, and um, yeah, bless the Lord and with our giving. So God, we thank you once again. We're so grateful, so grateful to your love, your grace, that unmerited and undeserving grace and mercy and how your love is from love everlasting to everlasting. That's your love. It never ends. Um, you don't change how much you love us no matter what we do. You love us. It's bottom line. And you showed it in the most extreme way in sending your son. If we ever question whether you love us, we just have to look to that cross and how you sent your son to be willing to pay our penalty of sin, that holy, righteous Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So thankful. So Lord, bless this offering. May we, again, I want to ask God for wisdom, for wisdom to use it well, that we would be people of integrity with our finances, good stewards. It all belongs to you. Lord, I pray that every one of us will be good stewards of the everything you've given us. In your name, Jesus, amen. All right. Well, good morning again. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that um, just really is important to understand is God's looking for a heart that's toward him, a heart that worships him. So that's great when we can just open up and just express our love to God and be touched by Him. So Lord, I, I want to ask that even as this word of yours goes forth, as we study the scripture this morning, that your spirit would just powerfully illuminate. Lord, even with our understanding, we can read the words, but unless you bring revelation, we don't truly understand it. So I'm asking for some aha moments today. I'm asking for an expansion of our understanding of who you are, an understanding of who we are, an understanding of the place that you have given us as your people. And so, Lord, move by your spirit today. We just invite you to come and touch our hearts in a new way. Amen? amen? Amen means so be it. So if you said amen, you said amen to the whole thing. Well, last week, no, two weeks ago, I, I started talking about, uh, I wanted to do uh, some, some um, teachings on life as God intends it to be because I think that's what we need to look at. If we want to find out what's going on in our life and measure it, not in a negative sense, but measure it to see if we're experiencing the fullness of what God wants, we have to look in our life, not so that we're just being interior gazers, but we need to figure out what did God create us for? What did he create us to be? And who we are in him and so when we begin to do that it, it begins to open up revelation and and that's why i talk about life as god intends it to be because unless we know what he has for us we can't pursue that we can't go after it i think you've already noticed that when you accept jesus christ everything in the universe doesn't change now you're perfect and you can just walk and 100 percent you have increased super knowledge of god and 
See, everything God has and what the scripture shows us that when we come to God, we come to him as a baby in Christ and we grow in a relationship. We grow in our understanding of who he is. The more we turn to him, the more we look at him, the more we begin to understand and it grows and it increases. And as we start walking in obedience to the word, we're, we're doing like babies sometimes. Maybe we're getting up and falling down, man. They do that a lot. They get up and boom, boom, and you just like you're always worried about them thumping their head against something, but because they're so, un, but they're getting up and they're going to learn to walk, and then they learn to walk and they begin to mature, they begin to grow, and they go. And the Bible talks about, uh, like John's written this, he's writing, he says, I'm writing this to you, little children. And then he says, I'm writing this to you, young men. And then he says, I'm writing to you, this to you fathers. He's talking to the different generations of those, not physical generations, but spiritual generations. Because you can be old and be a baby <laughs> in the Lord, right? So we don't mature instantly in the Lord. We don't go from, from a baby to a spiritual giant it's a process of maturing and walking with God and moving with him, and we grow and mature and we become more like him. So we have to figure out, I think, what, what is life as God intends it to be? And knowing what that is, then we can press in for those. And I think I'm just going to give you just a brief thing. I think he wants to touch every area of our life. I think he wants to touch uh, us spiritually. He wants to touch us emotionally. He wants to touch our minds, our thought life. He wants to touch um, our bodies. He wants, to, he wants to touch the wholeness of who we are as individuals. But more than that, he wants to touch the community. He's got a community. It's not just about us as individuals. God didn't create us to be all by our lonesome and grow up spiritually mature because you can't grow up spiritually mature apart from people. You can't mature in your gifts if you don't exercise them towards people. You can't grow in the things of God, truly grow and, and become more patient, more kind and all the things that the scripture talks about unless you are with people. People are important. The community is important. So God wants to build us as individuals. He wants to build us as individual families. He wants to build us as a corporate group of body of believers that that are in a location. He wants to build us. He wants to actually touch our communities. He wants to touch our cities. He wants to touch our, our states and our nations. He wants to touch everything and bring his purposes about. And when we see God do that, there's something that's released that's great. So last time we looked at, we were created for intimacy we looked at the same passage of scripture that we're going to look at today because there's another part in here that I want us to get out. Usually what happens is that when you see God speaking about something the first time in scripture, it's a big deal. When he talks about something, it shows what he intends and what his plan is. And so if you want to, go to Genesis chapter 1. And we're, we're, as usual, we're going to flip through a ton of scriptures because that's what I preach. I, I, you know, the Bible, I, I have to preach that. And so we'll go from passage to passage to passage and try to put some of these things together for us. So today I want to talk about life as God intends it to be, that we're created to rule. Now let's look at this Genesis passage. Then God said, verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish. There's the word rule instantly. He says, let's create man and let them rule. Okay, so this is important and this is where we're getting this. This is in Genesis uh, chapter 1, very first chapter of the Bible. He says, let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful. 
and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now that means every living thing. So God says, I want you to rule. I've created you to rule. And we understand what this, what this means in God's perspective when we look at the scripture. He's the Lord, but he has created us to rule with him, to be co-rulers. We're not equal with God. We're submitted to God. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the Almighty. He's the Great One. But He calls us, mankind, into a relationship of ruling in this earth and what that means. And I'm going to talk about, I, I can't talk about the whole topic, but I'm going to talk about a portion of it because there's so much in the Scripture. But He says this, I want you to rule over everything, everything that moves on the earth. So He's talking about all the creatures and all those things. So at this point, when God speaks these things, this is the sixth day of creation. And he says everything was very good. So, depending on how you look at it, and I try to look at it as, as clear as the scripture says, that when God created this, at this point in time, everything is perfect, everything is wonderful, everything is good. But we know at some point, Satan falls, Satan gets kicked out of heaven because of his pride, he comes and enters the garden in chapter 3. So I believe that sometime between this creation of everything that was very good satan rebelled fell we don't know how long adam and eve were in the garden it doesn't say you know a lot, a lot of times when we read it we might think well god created him the next day satan came we have no idea when that serpent came we have no idea he lived for hundreds they lived for hundreds of years um, before they had you know uh before they died so anyway during this time frame, the enemy comes. And I believe God foresaw this thing because obviously we, we believe that he sees all things. He knows all things. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows all of history. That's why he can speak prophetically. Pro God's prophetic words that are actually come from him and are spoken through people because people are prophets. That means a mouthpiece for God. They're speaking for God. When he has them speak and they speak a true word of God, it's not guess. It is absolute because God knows the future. He knows everything. That's why God says he knew Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Do you think that tax surprised him? That they you know, had to go to, oh no, they have to go to Bethlehem. I better change my word. No, he didn't have to change it because he knew Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And he knew he would be a Nazarite, which would be from Nazareth. He knew that he would be riding in on a donkey. He knew that he would be nailed to a cross because he knows all things. And so a prophetic word that comes forth. And so, so here's, here's God speaking to these people and he's saying, I, I know what's going on ahead of time. So I'm telling you, I'm giving you the power to rule over everything on the face of this earth even when all things were very good, because I do believe he knew about Satan. And because he knew about the serpent, because he knew what was going to take place, he had created them and given them power and authority over everything. Everything. So he says, be fruitful. Some people, people think be fruitful and multiply go together. Um, because it's just talking about kids, but think about what the Bible says fruit is. Jesus says you'll bear much fruit. You know, if you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. Do you think he's just talking about children? <laughs> no, he's talking about fruitfulness, a life of fruitfulness, because God's blessing them now. He wants them to be fruitful and increase in every, every way. He wants the crops to, to do well. He wants the animals to do well. He wants everything to prosper. And if you look at what, what God calls the blessings and the curses that are in the book of Deuteronomy, when he begins to speak this, he says, blessed are you going to be in the city, blessed are you going to be in, a, in the country, blessed are you going to be wherever you walk. And he's talking about, about life and abundance. He's talking about fullness and in and, and every area of life, like 
children being born, animals being born, plants and crops and, and everything and peace and prosperity. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about this. So he says, be fruitful. Then he says, multiply, which of course, he says, multiply and fill the earth. Now he's talking about kids. He says, multiply, increase. And of course, over time they have, and we have what we have right now. All that came out of two people. And if you think about it, you start looking at some families, you start multiplying things, and you can find out in like two or three generations how many people they can have. It's just amazing. Because like, for example, when, when Jacob, Jacob's generations, when he came down to Egypt, there were 70, actually 72 people, 70 people that he brought, and then there was the one son that was, was there being held captive and Joseph, so 72 people from one person. Well, him and his wife, but you know what I'm saying? Out of, out of Jacob and his relations with his wives, the children of Israel. And then you think, take that, and then you increase it, and then you increase it. And pretty soon, by the time 400 and some years are, are passed um, from that time, there are uh, millions because they just increase and keep going and they didn't have small families most of the time so be fruitful multiply fill the earth that was one of the commands that he even made to noah they were to fill the earth and they were to 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 do that and they were to subdue it they were to bring it under the authority of of god and why would that have have to be and again i think it's because obviously god knew satan would rebel and there would be a spiritual battle and a warfare that must take place. And so they were to subdue it and they were to rule over every living thing. So this ruling is what we want to talk about today. So uh, I'm going to say two things that ruling isn't. <laughs> because I always do this. You got to make it clear what it is. Because some people say, you know, I'm going to rule. And, and it's like they're just going to go through life. Nothing's going to touch them. They're just going to, I'm ruling and reigning. And off they go. And then they forget the rest of the Bible. You got to have the wholeness of the Bible. All of it. And so ruling doesn't mean this. Complete, powerful rule with no problems. Doesn't mean that. Because we have so much biblical evidence. And we even have Jesus himself telling us. He tells us in John 16, 33. He says, these things I've spoken to you so that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. So Jesus said, in this world we'll have tribulation. Now tribulation has to do with people doesn't have to do with Satan because we'll deal with him in, a, in, in well, maybe more than a minute because he's down the line here. But it's talking about people. He's talking about persecution, about being persecuted because of Jesus Christ. And I, I can show you this very clearly. So you can say, well, that was Jesus talking before the resurrection. After the resurrection, everything changed. Did it? Well, there was a man named Saul, and if you remember, Saul was violent against the church. He was going to Damascus to try to take people and capture them, bring them back to Jerusalem and kill them. He was, he was vehemently opposed to Christianity. He hated and, and wanted to see them dead, and he, he said uh, in some of his testimonies as he was preaching to different rulers and things like that throughout the book of Acts, he begins to tell a story how he, he voted for many people to be killed. And so he was a persecutor of the church. And so he's on his way to Damascus, and what happens is that Jesus shows up brighter than the noonday sun. And if you've ever been over there at noon when you're out in the wilderness and it is bright and it will burn your eyeballs out. It's kind of like snow blindness here. They've got the desert and stuff. So anyway, he's on his way to Damascus. The Lord shows up. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he goes, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So you see that when people persecute the church like he was doing, they're 
persecuting the body of Christ. It's no joke when he says we're his body. And so when we're persecuted, it's him who's being persecuted. So we have to understand that. And Jesus told us, he said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. So there are always going to be people who hate God, who hate the things of God, refuse to submit to God, and will persecute and, and come against the people of God. And so here's what happened, is that when this bright light came, obviously when you have a bright light suddenly hit your face, brighter than the noonday sun, he was blinded for three days. He couldn't see a thing. He had scales on his eyes. It just burned his eyes. And because of the brightness of the glory of Jesus, Jesus sends a guy named Ananias. And he says, I want you to go to him. He's my chosen vessel. I want you to lay hands on him. I want you so that his, he'll be healed and he will um, receive the Holy Spirit. And here's what, here's what God says to Ananias. And this is in uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 15 and 16. So he says, but the Lord said to Ananias, right, said to him, go for he, Saul, is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. He says, for I will show him how much he must suffer because of my name or in behalf of my name. See what he's saying? He's going to suffer on behalf of of my name. And we know if we look at Paul's life, that dude suffered. He was beaten with rods. He was whipped five times. He was stoned. And they thought he was dead. They drug him out of the city. But God raised him up. He got up and <laughs> went back in. Just, it, just crazy the things that he faced. But he faced them because he was preaching Jesus. People wanted to kill him everywhere he went. They hated his guts because he was preaching and proclaiming Jesus. But look at what it says in Acts chapter 14. So this, Paul, Paul is preaching. He's gone through some cities, some Antioch and Icarium, Lystra, um, and he's going and, and he's preaching, and they come from these other cities from at least three cities that I think this the scripture says, at least three of them, and uh, they come to stir up trouble. So 14, verse 21, says, And they preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples. Now he was just killed with stones, right? Or, and then they drug him out as dead, and God raised him up. It says, and made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And these tribulations, again, are being persecuted. It's not. Uh, any other things. It's being persecuted. It's not God doing things to, to us or anything else. It's man resisting God. And so they, he went right back to the very places that sent people to stone him. It's amazing. And so off he went, and he understood this. And then we have our friend Peter. And Peter's talking to those he's writing to. He's writing to the Jewish folks that are scattered throughout all the land because they call it the diaspora. It's they, they were out and they were all over the world. Remember on the day of Pentecost, they had people from all the nations, Jewish people from all these nations, all over the Mediterranean and over all over the Middle East, North Africa, all those kind of things. They all came. And so... He's writing to the Jews who are in the diaspora, and then he says to them, he says uh, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though something strange were happening to you. 
But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that at the revelation of his glory you may also rejoice and be overjoyed. And so he's, he's speaking to them and encouraging them. In the, the second letter, I think it talks about people that were having their houses confiscated. People were being thrown into prison and all these things for following after Jesus, just what's, what Paul had done when he was Saul. And, and so what happens is that he says, this fiery ordeal, it's, it's no big surprise. We, in, in other places, he says, I even forewarned you ahead of time that we, we would suffer persecution. So then this ruling doesn't mean that we won't bear persecution because that's a spiritual war that's going on till the day when Jesus Christ returns and sets all things straight. There's going to be a spiritual war, a spiritual battle. Those who will stand against us. I was wondering if I should talk about this, but I might. Well, you know, we have to have reality. We have to have the reality of Scripture. So I was watching. You might want to watch this. It's not, this, this isn't for watching for fun. <laughs> this, is, this is called um, Sheep Among Wolves. There's two of them. You go, just go, go to YouTube. Sheep Among Wolves. There's version one and two. And so in version one, it, it's talking about in the Middle East that when they convert, like a Muslim person converts to Jesus Christ, that there's a possibility that they're going to be persecuted, even to the point of death. Some families think it's an honor thing. You turn from, from our faith to Christ, it's, it's the, for the honor of the family, we'll kill you. And that's an honor killing in their mind. They're bringing back the honor of the family because they dishonored by following Christ. But they were talking about this one young lady, and they were they talked to each other because they never know when someone's going to kick their door down and all of a sudden grab them, take them, imprison them, or do whatever. And so they were talking about one young lady, and so she was saying this, what happens if they come in, and they, she was being asked, what happens if they come in and rape you? Because that's one of the things that they do to women many times when these things take place. And so, you know what she said? She said, I will close my eyes and I will say to Jesus, I give you my body as a living sacrifice. That's amazing. It's amazing because they face this stuff on a daily basis in some of the places. We have so incredible freedom and wonderful things in our nation and there are those who are being persecuted. There are those who are being imprisoned and tortured. There are those, you know, there are so many books if you want to read testimonies about some of the different people and how they tortured them. Some of them they would hang upside down, have their feet up and beat their feet with rods, just beat them till they were all bloody and bruised. And then they couldn't even walk because they were so damaged. They would do things like that in order to try to get them to turn away from accepting Christ. And you know what's so interesting about those folks that are going through this? What they were doing is they were always praying that the people who were doing this would come to Jesus, that they would get saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so there's something about the power of God to remember that there is a war that we're in. And we might not have it as thick as some other places, but it's there and you never know when it's going to happen. So in, in other words, we are not completely powerful and rule with nothing happening. If, if anyone teaches you that, they're crazy. They're against the word of God 100,000%. Because I just showed you a few scriptures, and I could take you through dozens that show you that those who live a godly life will be persecuted. So we need to be prepared for that. All right, here's the second one. Are you ready for this one? This is my favorite. This one is, uh, if we're talking about ruling, it means I'm not the boss of you, right? Rule over every creature, so I'm going to rule over everyone. Who's going to rule over, we're going to all rule over each other? 
you know, there's, there's position within the kingdom of God, I understand that. And there's governments, all those kind of things. So there are things that are set up as, as government and rule and those kind of things, but those are set up by God. So when he calls us to rule, it doesn't mean I'm going to be the boss of somebody, that I'm going to tell people what to do, that I'm going to rule over them. That's not what he's talking about. And if we want to understand what's happening, we can just go ahead, go to Matthew chapter 20. And this is Jesus talking, and I love it because he shows us the absolute truth of what he's talking about. When he's talking about ruling, when God's talking about ruling, it's us underneath him living out the life as he intends it to be and honoring people, building people up, and thinking of them more than ourselves. That's the kind of leadership that Jesus wants. And so what he's talking about in Matthew chapter 20, it's, uh, it's always interesting because... <clears throat> So what happens in the earlier part of this passage is that, remember, uh, John, James and John, they're brothers, and so the, the mom comes and says, I want my kids to sit on the left hand and the right hand in glory when you come to your, your rule and your reign. So she's a mama looking out for her kids, trying to get them the key position and those things. And so Jesus has an answer. And then all the rest of the disciples here and they're ticked off because they, they want the same thing. <laughs> they want to be on the left or the right. They want to be the chosen ones. But here's what Jesus said. In verse 24 it says, And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers, and Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Now that's great words. Who wants to be a servant and a slave? But in God's kingdom, that's what ruling means, that we're serving him and serving others according to his purpose and plan. It says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come for everybody just to bow down to him and listen to his instructions and, and I'm going to command you to do all this kind of stuff. And he didn't come here with that kind of a concept. He came and he led by serving others. What did he do? He served people. He preached. He proclaimed. He set people free. He ministered to them. He gave them life. And he says, am I Lord? Yeah, I am. And you're right. But he said, I came to serve and give my life a ransom. He didn't just come to rule with an iron scepter. He will when he comes back because he's going to set things straight according to righteousness and to God's purpose. Every wrong will be righted. He'll take care of those things. But I'm not the boss. You're not the boss. This ruling doesn't mean that we just have power now like the world thinks of power. And Go to uh, Philippians chapter 2 because this gives us an absolute insight that we would have no other way. We would have this no other way if the Word of God didn't show us this, of what Jesus was thinking, what was in his mind. Because if it's not written, we don't know. I don't know what's in your mind. You don't know what's in my mind. But the Word of God reveals Jesus' heart and attitude and encourages us to do the same thing. So uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Now here we go. This is the revelation that we're seeing. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, in other words, he was God, 
He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant. Remember, become a slave? He took the form of a bond servant, a slave. And being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And for this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So the idea is that we need to have the same mind and attitude and thoughts that Jesus had, who was willing to come. You know, when it talks about him coming from heaven in other portions of Scripture, it talks about when he emptied himself, that what he did is when he came as a man, he did not come with any of the power, with any, anything. He limited himself to being fully man, even while being God. I don't know how... He didn't use any of his divine power. It says that the Holy Spirit anointed him. It says that the Father directed him, showed him everything he should do. So he emptied himself and became a bondservant. And so that's what we're encouraged, to live this same life. So when we're talking about ruling, we're ruling under God and we're ruling with the same attitude of Christ. And that's the powerful thing. So what does it mean? Well, just like I looked at two no's, I'm going to talk about two areas of rule. The first one is a rule over Satan. And the first thing that we're encouraged to do is to be alert. So if you go to 1 Peter 5.8, many of you know this scripture. It's just a, uh, a really common one that we speak of. But it says, be of sober spirit. It's 1 Peter 5.8. Be on the alert. So he's saying, be serious about this. Keep your eyes focused because there's something that's happened. Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brothers and sisters who are in the world. And again, this is talking about persecution right now. But it says resist the devil because he's going to come and he's going to press in and he's going to seek to bring uh, oppression and all the things that he brings. But we're to be alert, we're to be aware, and we're to stand against him. And then another passage of Scripture talks about us being knowledgeable 2 Corinthians 2.11, we need to be knowledgeable about our enemy. And it says that, I'm just reading, I'm not going to read these whole passages, but it says, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we're not ignorant of his schemes. Just as the word of God says, God says, I have a plan for your life. I have a purpose for you. So does Satan. Satan has a plan for you to be destroyed, to be in bondage, to be under his authority and control. And so he has schemes and plots and strategies that he uses over and over and over and over and over. And it works all the time. And he's been doing it from the very beginning. He started with Adam and Eve, and now he continues with all his demonic forces to do this and the schemes of the enemy. But see, God doesn't leave us unarmed. God doesn't leave us alone to face the enemy in our own strength and our own power. And so that's why if you go to Ephesians chapter 6, and this is really this portion, this verse 10, I like it because it talks about three words for power, three distinct words that deal with strength and power. And so what Paul says now, remember Paul, the guy who was crunching everybody and doing all that stuff, putting them in prison? He says, finally, be strong in the Lord. Didn't say be strong in yourself. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. 
And so this is showing us that the, the strength and the power and the might that we need comes from God. It's not from us. And so often we think it has to be us. It's our power, our might. No, we, Satan could defeat us in two seconds if God allowed it. Wouldn't even take two, one. <laughs> Bam, we're done. But he's put some boundaries on Satan. But it says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against what? The schemes of the devil. Now, this is translated in both those places, schemes. One means strategies and one means overall plans. He has an overall plan of destruction, but he has different strategies to bring them about. We're not ignorant of these strategies. We're not ignorant of his plan. That's why we need to put on the full armor of God. And if you look at the full armor of God, I think a lot of people just focus on the body parts, you know, like the breastplate, the belt, or the helmet. And he did that so they would have a picture to remember but the thing is, is that it's talking about the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. So God has weapons for us, which is truth and righteousness and faith, where we can extinguish all the fiery darts of the enemy. And so the focus is not just on the, on the body part, because if you look at other scriptures, they talk about uh, helmets and, and breast pieces and stuff like that and use different things. But the idea is that we have truth, that we have righteousness, that we're doing it God's way and his spirit and his attitude, in it, which is the right way, and we do these things. And so he says, do this so that you can stand firm against the enemy, that we can stand against the enemy, and he has to flee from us. He is under, uh, basically, God's given us authority over the enemy. It says it in multiple locations. In Luke uh, 9, 1, we need to be authorized and empowered, and we have been. It says, he called the 12 together, gave them power and authority over all demons and uh, to heal diseases. So he gave them authority over all demons and the power to heal diseases. So that's why... When we sense there's a demonic force, we stand against it in Jesus' name. That's why we pray for healing, because he's given us authority to pray for these things and power to do those things. And so it's really important. And then I like this one in Luke 10, 19. He says, Behold, I have given you authority to walk on snakes and scorpions and authority over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Now, don't even think... I for a moment that these snakes and scorpions that he's talking about are real ones. You know what I'm saying? Because there's the ones that handle snakes and do all that stuff to prove their faith and all that kind of stuff. That's not what he's talking about. The, Satan's known as the serpent, right? And so we, you know, a snake is representative of, of, of Satan and those kind of things. He's also called a dragon. He's, there's a lot of different names that he goes by in different images, just like there's different images of the Holy Spirit and all these things. Um, but so it's saying that we, we are going to be able to overcome and walk over all the power of the enemy. And so we have to understand that's part of his plan, it's part of his purpose for us. He has equipped us with his power to do this. It's not our own authority, it's his authority given to us. In this, I was thinking, I was thinking about Adam and Eve. Adam had an opportunity, Eve had an opportunity to stand up against the serpent and kick that dude out. You have authority over every living creature. And so when this serpent came, they listened. Eve was deceived. Adam sinned purposefully. Scripture tells us that. Eve said, I was deceived. Talks about it, I think, also uh, in Peter, if I remember right. I might be wrong on that, but 
I know it's in the New Testament. I know lots of stuff. I don't sometimes know the exact reference. But it talks about Eve was deceived. But Adam just purposefully chose. He could have said, like Jesus did in the wilderness, Satan, get behind me. He could have taken that authority because he had given it. He had it. And when he obeyed the serpent, he gave his power over to the enemy. That's how in the scripture, in the New Testament, after Jesus was resurrected, he's called the Lord of this world, the God of this world, because he has that authority. Because man handed it over, and that's why the kingdom of God is about bringing and breaking the power of the enemy and bringing the will and purpose of God in people's lives. That's what it's all about. All right, we better hurry. Now we need to talk about he's given us rule over ourselves. And this is an interesting one. And it's something that's, that's very... A lot of times people feel they're helpless to sin. And God has given us authority over sin in our lives that sin will not be a master. And I want to talk about this because I think it's important that we understand this because we struggle with things because we don't understand who we are. We just don't understand what's happened when we've come to Christ. And it really becomes important for us to get this. So we need to rule over ourselves. Let's go to Genesis because God even speaks this and, and says it in kind of an interesting way. So do you remember that in chap chapter 4 what happens is, you know, Cain and Abel are born and uh, Abel has the sheep of the flock. He offered a sacrifice to God, and God accepted it. Abel uh, brought stuff from the fields because he was a farmer and stuff. He brought crops and stuff like that, and he made an offering unto the Lord, and it said that God accepted uh, Abel's, but he didn't accept Cain's, and Cain got mad. It says he was very angry, and his face... He had a problem with his face. It says his countenance had fallen. So his countenance fell. And in verse 6 of chapter 4, the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. I thought that was interesting. So sin is pictured like, a, like a, some kind of creature just waiting to pounce. Sin's crouching at the door. You open that door and sin, and you're going to be destroyed because it desires him. And so we get this picture that God says, you must master this. He had a choice, and he chose wrong because in the very next verse, he killed his brother. And then God's, God confronted him. He says, your brother's blood's crying out. And he was under a curse because he had shed blood, innocent blood. And so we see this, but isn't that interesting? Sin is lurking at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. All right, let's go to Romans chapter 6. We're going to look at two more passages of Scripture, and then we can finish up here. But Romans chapter 6, and this is some classic chapters 6, 7, and 8 are really major, major ones here, but we're going to start in verse 12. We could read the whole thing, but it takes a long time. So we're going to start in verse 12. It says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. There's that word lust or desire again. Because all a lust is is a strong desire. Obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin 
as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be a master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then, shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Now I want you to think about this. Sometimes it's taught that there's like a dual nature. I know I've heard this this. Uh, uh, there's a guy named Watchman E, and, and he said, there's a black dog, and there's a white dog, and whichever one you feed will win, thinking that we have two natures within us. But if we remember what the Word of God says, and I've said this before, I want you to think this through if you've never thought it through before. It says that when we're in Christ, we're a new creation. That means we're totally, absolutely, newly created. When we're created, we're created righteous. And you say, well, wait a minute. I, I, I have these thoughts. I have these ideas. I have these things that come into my mind. But let me tell you this. When you're a new creation, you are righteous. And it says that when Jesus went to the cross, we died. The old man is dead, right? Dead. Dead. We died with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so we have a new nature. We're made righteous by the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so we can stand. And so then you go, well, wait a minute. I still have all these thoughts. I still do these things. I still sin. And the reason is, is because we don't understand who we are. We don't understand that we're new creatures. And that sin is coming from the outside and that we have to meet it and, and resist it, not in our own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, we're going to see this in, in when we go to Romans chapter 8. We need to be slaves, it says, to righteousness because we're alive unto God. You're dead to sin, but alive to God. All right, so here's, here's how it goes. So you say, well, if, if I'm holy and if I'm righteous and I'm great before God, why do I have these thoughts? Would you agree with me that Adam and Eve never sinned before they sinned in the garden? That they were pure, that they were righteous, they were naked and unashamed, they were perfect before the Lord? They chose to sin and it brought forth death. So a person who's brand spanking new can be tempted it talks about how we're tempted when we're carried away by our own lust. Don't ever say God tempts us, but we're tempted by our own desires. When these thoughts come to us, they're coming from outside of us. If they're not righteous thoughts, then they're not our thoughts because we're new creatures in Christ and to understand that. Now let's see what it says in Romans 8 because that really becomes the powerful part of this. Romans chapter 7, if you want to read chapter 7, it's go, oh, I, I, I agree with God and I do the very things I don't want to do. There's this going back and forth. I, I go back and forth. So it's sin. It's sin. Sin's the, the culprit here. But then it comes to Romans chapter 8. And Romans chapter 8 negates Romans chapter 7. Once we come to Romans 8, we can't go back to 7. 
because it, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And it says in chapter 8, verse 1, 2 now, for the law of the spirit of life. Did you hear that? There's a law in the New Testament. There's no Old Testament law that brings forth death, but there's a law. It says for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through our flesh, that's why we can never do it. We'd fail all the time. But that's why we need the Spirit. That's why we need the Spirit of God. God did it, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we can walk in the Spirit. It says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are walking in the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So we can set our mind on the things of the Spirit. That's a choice, a decision that we make. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. And that when we fix our thoughts on him and walk in obedience to the way he has in the strength of the spirit. Walking in the spirit means we're allowing his might to work through us. For the mindset on flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He says, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give you life in your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So there's this empowering of the Holy Spirit going to quicken, make us alive unto God. So then, brethren, we are not under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit... You are putting to death the deeds of the body you will live. So this again shows us, by the Spirit, we're putting to death the deeds of the flesh. We have power to say no to those things that come to us. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, those are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, which we cry out, Abba, Father. It says you've received it. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. And if children were heirs also, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Now listen to what he says. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that's revealed to us. So what the scripture is telling us is that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we've been changed and transformed and we can live a different life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what happens is because I think this happens so easily because we have a thought enter our mind we think it's ours if you're repulsed by a thought why would it be yours you ever think of that if you're repulsed by a thought if you're pulled towards something that you hate and don't want to do why would you think it's you but we hear these things in our mind and then we we instantly 
equate that with sinfulness and us being sinners. That's not, Jesus was tempted. The enemy spoke to him, tempted him to do things. And we only, we only heard of three. Because it says after Jesus rebuked him, sent him away, it says the, the, the devil waited for an opportune time. He never stopped. Jesus was tested more than just three times in the wilderness. He was tested in the garden for sure. But how many other times did thoughts come from the enemy? Did he speak those things? Do you think for one second Jesus thought, oh, that's my thought, I'm sinful, I'm bad, I'm ugly, I'm dirty, I'm rotten. You think for one moment? But when these things come, and we hate them, they're not of us. They're not of our new nature. And that's why, I think Suzette put it this way, is that Christians... True, true believers make terrible sinners because they can't deal with it. Because the Spirit of God says, this is not who you are. This is not you. You're a son. You're a daughter. Rise up. You're dead to sin. Live for God. And that doesn't mean we don't have struggles. But it says, through God, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. We can overwhelmingly conquer. Wish I had time to talk about a whole bunch of other things because there's a lot of stuff between sin and sins and all these kind of things that are really important for us to understand when we read the scripture. Simply put, we're new creatures in Christ. We're here to rule with him. And we're to bring his kingdom to bear in the lives of people. Wherever we see things that are not of the kingdom, then we can pray and we can act to bring them about. So, just want to give opportunity for anyone who needs to accept Christ. You've never done it before. What we do is we make Jesus Christ Lord. Let there be no absolute question about it. We don't just ask for forgiveness of sin so we don't go to hell. What we do is we respond to the one who loved us, who gave himself on the cross, who paid the penalty for our sin. And so what we do is we say yes to him because Jesus commanded men to repent, all men, everyone, People, all people, because when you use that word nowadays, there's a different meaning to it. But all people, he commands to repent, to take him as Lord. And that is death on the cross. He paid the penalty for your sin. He paid the penalty for my sin. And that we can become new creatures in Christ through believing in him. So if you're out there today and... Uh, and you need to accept Christ, I want you to go ahead and you can respond in the message and say, you know, I need to accept Christ and I'll contact with you, get in contact with you, talk with you. But if there's anyone here, I always give an opportunity for folks that are in here that say, you know, I've never accepted Christ, I want to make him Lord of my life, then I want to give you that opportunity so you can raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me. Because we're talking about giving yourself to the one who gave himself for you. So, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your great compassion and mercy in us and that, Lord, you paid the penalty. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the great salvation that you've given us. Thank you that you have made us sons. It says in John chapter 1, verse 14, that you gave us the right to become children of God. When we come to you and we accept you, you give us that right. And we're children. So thank you for that. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' strong name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have an awesome day.
Remember that Jesus loves you with an everlasting love. It will never change. It will never falter. God's good. Amen.